This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by Athon Books. Check out the very best in science fiction and fantasy at athonbooks.com. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Christina McDonald on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book that's out everywhere today, so you can run out and grab uh, this awesome book that we're going to talk about today. It's called Do No Harm, and uh, what an amazing thrill ride uh, of a book. You're going to love this. Uh, Welcome to the show, Christina. Hi, Hank. Thank you so much. It's just such a pleasure to be here. It's uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I've been really looking forward to this um, since last year and uh, yeah. with all of the, the craziness that that kept us from getting to uh, the <laughs> yeah. chat last year. But um, I'm so glad we could we could make it up uh, now. But, Christina, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so I've always wanted to be a writer. I've always been, you know, kind of an inherent storyteller. I have two younger sisters, so I told my very first story tell- stories to them. Um, I think my my first stories were fairy tales. They were just silly little fairy tales about, you know, one was called The Girls with Golden Hair, and our goal was to get a get sweets. And so we sold our hair, and we they, it was gold. So we got lots of sweets, you know, so just silly fairy tales like that from when I was very, very small. Um, and as I got older, I went into journalism and then I went into digital copywriting. And so I've just always told stories. I've always wanted to write in whatever format that's been. I've always just been a writer. That's always what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, you know, a, a lot of people have that early desire and they're just just born storytellers. There's just no other way to describe that. Um, yeah. But there, there is something that happens when you take this natural inclination or ability, or, or you know, however you want to describe that, and and turn that to a career and and become uh, a published writer who's you know has a a particular focus, and and you are um, you know actively writing and publishing. Um, do you remember when that became? Uh, a reality to you and, 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 you know, that the, the, you could see the path laid out. Yeah, actually. Yeah, I do. I remember the moment and it's so bizarre that you asked that question. Cause it was, um, it was right before new year's, maybe I, I want to say about 10 years ago, it was so long ago. And I was talking to my brother-in-law about how I really wanted to write the story. It was just a story I had in my head. And he said, you should write that. And I said, I will. It's my it's my New Year's resolution. And I'm not a person that makes New Year's resolutions. I just don't do that. (laughs) So I made this New Year's resolution and I I decided to stick to it. And I sat down and I wrote that story and um, it it didn't get published, but I did get an agent. And then um, it went out on submission and didn't didn't get it didn't sell to anywhere. And I was devastated. But it was, I was so close, you know? So then I kind of was, I was stuck. Like I didn't want to give up. I wanted to keep writing. And so I did. And I wrote a few more books and eventually I got to, um, I got a new agent and I got, and I wrote The Night Olivia Fell. And, you know, that was my first book that was traditionally published, but there were books before that, that didn't get published, but it all came from just having a conversation with my brother-in-law about a story that was in my head and him saying, you should write that. And I was like, actually, I will. It will be my New Year's resolution. (laughs) (laughs) I love that so much. And 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 I also love that you have a couple of trunk novels or desk drawer novels. uh, You know, however we refer to those. That's um, it's it's kind of a rite of passage. uh, Writing is one of those weird things that um, you can you can know how to do it. Uh, you can you can sit down and type from from chapter one to the end, um, and uh, but you you may not 
understand uh, how stories work or unlock whatever the magical thing yeah. is that, that becomes the thing that connects with other people. Um, the, the night uh, uh, Olivia fell, your first published book, can you look at that book and then look at your other novels that you wrote prior to that? And can yeah. you see a difference in The Night Olivia Fell? And uh, yeah. is, is there a, a threshold that you stepped over with this book that yeah, you can definitely. you know put your finger on? I think when I first started writing, I had an idea of a story that I wanted to write, but I didn't have an idea of the genre that I wanted to write in. So I just didn't know really where those beats were and where, you know, what plot points did I need to hit for that genre? And so I had a story and I even had um, characters that that went through that story, but they weren't meeting those those plot points that you have to meet. So every genre has different plot beats that you that you hit. And for the for the night Olivia fell, um, I, I didn't intend to necessarily write a thriller or even really, a, it, was, it was always meant to be a mystery, but I didn't intend to make it so suspenseful. I meant it just as like a this emotional thing that was in me. And, and a lot of my writing is like that. It comes from a very emotional place in me. So when I wrote that book, um, it was actually shortly after my own father had passed away. So I was kind of processing my own grief. And, and obviously, it's a very different story. But a lot of that grief and processing goes into that story. And and throughout that, I also learned about the beats that you need to hit for that genre and, you know, where the inciting incident should be, where should the the this first plot point be and how does the climax happen? And, you know, so I learned all of these things and I, I read a load of books as well. And I went to a few, um, in fact, a different a few different classes on how to do it as well. So I kind of once I really was like, I'm actually I am going to get a book published. I was very determined and I sat down and I, I taught myself by reading various books, um, the beats to hit. And and once I knew how to do that, then writing The Night Olivia Fell just came a little bit easier <laughs> than those other books that had done. I, I'm so glad um, that you brought that up. Um, we talk about genre um, a lot and and how that um, uh, sometimes genre can be misleading and and it's really uh, sometimes it's, it's more, uh, it, it feels like that genre has more to do with, with pointing people to what part of the bookstore so they can find yeah. the type of story that they're looking for. Um, but, but you, you said that, that you wrote very intentionally and, and researched, you know, how exactly a story like you wanted to tell needs to work and and I'm, I'm not talking about um following a formula that's uh, so uh don't get me wrong um but there are certain things that that kind of define um the the boundaries of certain yeah. genres um what were can, can you point to you know a couple of those things that that uh that helped you to to get into your wheelhouse I think the biggest thing for the thriller, for the mystery and thriller genre that I learned was just having a really clear plot goal from very early on in the story. So you have a, a character, obviously, who has some internal and external needs that need to clash and create tension in, in, in some sort of a way. But also that needs she or he, the, the character, needs to be placed in like the deepest pile of trouble possible. <laughs> so whatever that plot is going to be, um, it needs to be furthered by these varying, you know, problems that she or he has. And and coming up with the tension and the, for me, um, and this isn't for all thriller authors, but the atmosphere for me lends, a, it's like a, a second character almost for me. Um, so just adding that to the story, yeah. Christina, you have a very interesting um, accent. Uh, where, uh, what, what informs that accent? So I'm originally from Seattle. I I was born and raised there, and then I I went traveling when I was in my early twenties, and I went to Ireland, and I got my master's degree in journalism there, and I met my husband, and we lived there for a number of years. And then after that, we moved to London, and we've we've lived in London ever since. So I've been away for almost half of my life now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I go back, I mean, obviously not this year. It's, it's been crazy, but I, I go back to Seattle to see my mom and my sisters as often as I can. 
Um, but we are quite settled in London I, and, you know, I love it here. I love the green space and I love the city when we can get out and we're not in lockdown. <laughs> Obviously, London's in lockdown right now. But um, yeah, I do love it here. And but I'm not saying I'd never go back. I would love to go back to Seattle and be closer to my family. So we'll just have to see what happens. So I love to to kind of look at the idea of place and and where you are from and and then, and maybe where you live currently how that affects your creative process can you uh d- is there anything that that you can point to that uh that kind of uh comes out of your west coast american upbringing yet then uh you know england and ireland um do, do you see that those have a factor in your creative yeah. process Possibly. So, so far, all of my books have been set in like the, the the fall or the winter. It's very gloomy. All the the leaves have been, all the trees have been kind of stripped of leaves. It's very almost haunted um, and atmospheric, lots of fog, lots of rain and thunderstorms. And I just, I do wonder, is that, does that have something to do with the fact that everywhere I've ever lived has been incredibly <laughs> rainy? <laughs> I do wonder if that atmosphere of each of the places that I've lived plays into my stories. I mean, in in my second book, Behind Every Lie, London literally is in the story. One of the characters goes to London to find out information about her mother. Um, and in, in the first book, it's it's set very much in in the Seattle sort of area. And same with in my, my new book, Do No Harm. It's set around this sort of Seattle area, maybe an hour from Seattle, um, but kind of nearer to the mountains. So there's a lot more of that kind of tension, that grittiness, that kind of wildness that you get once you head up into the mountains. There's a lot more snow and you can't control those those outside elements as much. Do you, um, do you remember what the um, the first idea for the night olivia fell was was it was it a character was it a setting um I, i'm fascinated by where stories begin like you know one moment there's nothing and the next moment you know there's a whole world and characters and you know plot do, do you remember how that began yeah so with the night olivia fell i had just had a baby and I was rocking him to sleep because he was really bad at taking naps. And so if he didn't take a nap, we would spend the whole rest of the day with him crying and me about to cry. So I was like, I'll just rock him to sleep. While I was doing this, um, I was reading the news on my phone and I came across a news article about this girl who'd gone in for um, surgery on her tonsils to get her tonsils removed. And while she was on the, the table, she, she died. She became brain dead. And I, as a new mother holding a brand new baby, I was so horrified. And, right. and of course, I'd also recently lost my own father. And so I was just so impacted by that thought of like, imagine losing your child and imagine watching them grow up. And what is her, this, this girl's mother going through? So from, from that one news story, I came, came up with the idea for The Night Olivia Fell. So I, I just wrote down really quickly kind of an idea of, of the story. And actually I didn't get around to writing it for a good few months after that, because, you know, new baby. Um, but then once I did get around to writing it, it really kind of flowed out of me and I wrote every spare second that I had. And it, you know, it was a very emotional story. I had a lot going on in my life emotionally. And, and I think a lot of that came out in that, in that book. Authors. I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called pub site. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. 
They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Dream Author by Sophie Hanna is an immersive 14-month coaching program for writers at any and every level of experience, and also for those of you who want to write and are just waiting for the right encouragement and guidance to get you started. Your writing dreams should make you happy. For so many of us, our dreams are not a source of happiness. Instead, they cause us stress, guilt, frustration, and even shame. Here's the great news. All of these feelings are natural and all writers experience them. The problem, though, is that when your writing dreams bring you more anxiety than joy, it affects your resolve and your productivity, and you end up not taking the action you need to take in order to propel your dreams in the right direction so that they can stand a strong chance of coming true. That's why Sophie created the Dream Author Coaching Program to teach anyone who is passionate about writing how to change the way they build, think about, and pursue their writing dreams in order to become their own most powerful ally and advocate for the rest of their writing life. And more great news. Once you've learned that skill, it lasts forever. Visit dreamauthorcoaching.com to get started today. So you followed that up with Behind Every Lie. Um, yeah. How, uh, you know, when, when you finished The Night Olivia Fell, it, uh, it got published, it found an audience. Um, then when you have to follow that up with your next book, you know, we, we, we talk about the, the sophomore slump sometimes. And, and I like to look at it a little differently uh, than, than just the sophomore slump. You know, when you first write that first book, um, no one is necessarily expecting it. You know, maybe a spouse, maybe a couple of close friends or some family might know that you're writing a book, maybe your brother-in-law. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but it's, not a, it's not a big audience. But then all of a sudden you have to, you know, crank up this creative uh, machinery inside of you again to duplicate that. But now there are expectations and, you know, deadlines and things like that. Um, when you when you publish behind every lie, were did you go through any of those those feelings and uh, and and was the the process of of duplicating that initial success was that daunting? It it really wasn't at first because I didn't know what to expect. Like I had, I hadn't actually heard of the sophomore slump, but especially when I sat down to write behind every lie, I just I was delighted that I'd sold the night Olivia fell. And so I was kind of on a high from that. So I just wrote from my heart. So, and, you know, initially like reviews came out, they were very good. And, um, so no, I wasn't really worried at all. I was actually quite excited about it. Um, the, the sales for behind every lie were less definitely than the night Olivia fell. And there has inevitably been some comparison, but I think that it's really important that when we create things that we we tend to create things and then we want to be able to hold it in our hand and and put a crown on it and go this was me you know and and it's like that like we need to be happy with what we've created rather than kind of making it part of our identity and and I think you know we probably as writers I would assume everybody does that I do that too but now that I'm a year out from behind every lie, I'm happy with that book and I love it. And for the most part, readers do too. So, you know, I feel like in that way, it was a, a big success. So after that, um, did you immediately start working on Do No Harm? Uh, I, I know the publication is just about a, a year apart. So yeah. um, what, what was the the first uh, idea for Do No Harm? Was it, was it the character of Emma or uh, how did that story begin? So all of my books are, they have something to do with me very personally. So with Do No Harm, I did start writing it um, almost immediately, about like probably about a month after Behind Every Lie came out, I started writing it. 
Um, and the idea had come about even before that. So the the idea came about because, well, I've wanted to set a thriller against the backdrop of the opioid epidemic for a really long time because most of my life, most of my adult life anyways, I've watched my brother's addiction to opioids. So this is a very, very personal issue to me. Um, watching someone you love go to war with themselves is just, it's truly a special level of hell and you feel this horrific sense of helplessness. And so I've wanted to write a book set against that sort of backdrop for a really long time um, because, you know, my 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 view and my ideas and my opinion of, of addiction and opioids has changed so much, you know, over, over the years of watching my brother struggle. And then um, before Behind Every Lie even came out, I saw this story in the news about a podiatrist in, in, in Indiana, of all places, who'd been arrested for starting an opioid ring. And I was like, why, why would you do that? Like, it just got me thinking, why do people start selling drugs? Is it money? Is it power? Is it, is it status? Um, why, why would somebody do that? And the only thing I believed I could ever really understand, given that I'd spent so many years watching my brother struggle with addiction was love. So my children, I would do anything for them. And so then I started thinking about tension and, and morals and well, why would somebody um, sell opioids? And and if they do, is that okay? You know, do the ends justify the means if you're a desperate mother trying to save your child's life? Is that okay? And so I started really kind of thinking about morals and how I could set that story up. And that's that was the first moment that that the story of Do No Harm kind of came about. But I did do months of research just to be able to get, you know, it, there's a, quite a lot of medical information in there. There's obviously a detective <laughs> is a is a point of view from a detective. So I wanted to make these things really authentic. So I did quite a lot of research and I even had um, a doctor read the book before I sent it into my editor to make sure that I had everything really authentic and really just, yeah, narrow, you know, really nailed down. <laughs> Well, the the title, um, you know, is, is obviously a play on uh, the uh, is it the Hippocratic Oath um, yeah. that first do no harm, yeah. um, and which gives us a glimpse into um, kind of the the viewpoint of the story. Uh, so Emma is is a doctor, yeah, and uh, and she is faced with, uh, and I, I love how you were talking about you know uh, understanding why people make the decisions they do and. And, yeah. it, you know, how you look at a person and, and say, how did this happen? You know, there has to be a story behind this. And 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 one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And, and you never you know expect to end up where you do. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a great story of of setting up um, the, the the perfect tension that would lead down this path. Um, when you started thinking of Emma. Did did you start thinking of scenarios that that you could get her into this situation? And like, how difficult was it to to dream up a scenario, um, you know, that that someone could go off the path like this? Um, it wasn't difficult at all. In fact, this was the easiest book I've ever written. It took me um, three months to the day to write this book, but I did do quite a lot of research before I sat down to write it. So, you know. There were months and months of research, but this this book was really easy to write. And I think that that's because I, again, had such a strong emotional connection to it. So even before I started writing, I knew that I wanted Emma to be a doctor and it, because she would have that access, that easy access to opioids. And I wanted her character arc. I wanted her to be an antihero, you know, not some like cool swashbuckling antihero who like is some sort of a maverick or anything like that, yeah. you know, that. She's she's no Walter White. She's not like trying to do this for power or anything like that. She's trying to do it for for a very noble cause, really, like to save her child's life. And so I wanted to set up something that's maybe a little bit more emotional. Um, and and the reason I chose her her character arc, to, you know, to make her an antihero, to to choose this kind of corruption arc, is that I wanted to show that there are so many in the oxy supply chain to, to blame. Like we have manufacturers, distributors, governments, politicians, um, you know, these, these guys, these corporations <laughs> that turbocharge opioid sales. Then we have pharmacies and then we have doctors and that they're all too ready to write a script. So 
I just wanted to show that until the system is fixed, there are these opportunists who do and will continue to use the opioid epidemic for their own personal gain. I really wanted to spotlight that. And so I knew before I even started the book that Emma was going to be an anti-hero on a corruption arc, but she has a noble reason for doing it so that people can really kind of kind of struggle with her motivations, but then understand them as well. You, you said that you wrote the book in three months uh, and did a lot of research on the front end. Um, is that your normal writing process? Do you normally familiar, familiarize yourself completely with the story before you sit down to start writing it? Well, it wasn't that I, uh, I mean, no, <laughs> is, is the simple answer to that. I'm not a plotter. I don't plot in any way. I completely pants it. I just start writing from the beginning. But with this book, because I did know that there were going to be some medical aspects, I did do um, research on the, the different kind of leukemia treatments that her Emma's son needs to go through, because obviously I, I don't know anything about that. So I wanted to make it authentic. So I had to kind of do that before I sat down to really write it. But normally, um, no, I kind of just research as I go. I would write just as I go. I don't really do a lot of plotting. I just, I'm very much, I'm not, you know, a natural sort of chess player. <laughs> I don't think two steps <laughs> ahead. I just, I write and then something happens and I go, oh yeah. So then the character would do this. So then I have to go back and edit. So I'm constantly moving a little bit forward and then going back and then moving forward. But in the case of this particular book, because there were medical aspects, I did have to research that just to make sure that I knew what plot could happen, <laughs> you know, just just because of the medical aspects. So do you feel like uh, that that has changed your your writing process for going forward? Or was this just a, you know, one of those incidents where the the story called for a little different approach? I think this story just called for a little different approach. I I don't I mean, every book is its own beast. I think, you know, you, every book is so different is what I'm finding. I mean, I I haven't published tons and tons of books, but my experience so far, <laughs> I'm currently writing my my fourth book, my next one. And it's different than it's very different than Do No Harm. So I think every every experience, every book is like a baby. It's like a child and every child is different. That's the best way I can explain it. <laughs> I gotcha. Um, Christina, we were supposed to talk um, last year and yeah. when when Behind Every Lie uh, came out and um, I, I was sick. I had COVID. The, you were sick and, and we just never could yeah. um, could connect. And, you know, yeah. it was a crazy year last year. Um, being a writer, uh, you know, Do No Harm is, is out now, meaning, um, you know, for those that 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 maybe don't have a glimpse into the publishing industry, you've probably been done with this book for a number of months and it's been off of your desk and, and then edits and, and all of that stuff. But your attention it has probably turned to a new book. And like you said, you were working on book four um, yeah. now, but what did last year, uh, how did that affect your creative process and your writing? Um, you know, writers a lot of times or most of the time spend, you know, countless hours alone in a room just with our mm -hmm. computers. Um, so, you know, a thing like a global pandemic, um, you would think that writers wouldn't be very um, impacted uh, in one way, yet we're all kind of dealing with this in, in different ways. And there are more aspects than just the getting up and going to work that, that have affected the world. Um, how has, how did 2020 affect you and, and all the stuff that you do? Such a good question. I, I'm not going to lie. It's been a tough year. I have two young children and I have to homeschool them. So <laughs> that's obviously been a challenge because I am not the type of writer who can write when there are children running around and when you're meant to be homeschooling them. Cause you know, my youngest is seven and there's just no way that he can homeschool himself. He needs constant interaction and engagement and he has right. questions about math and so in order for me to write, I have to get up at about five or six o'clock in the morning, write for a few hours and then put it aside and put on my homeschooling teacher hat and start doing that and then put that aside and then become mom again and do dinner and laundry and all that. And then once they're in bed, I get towards I, I get back to my desk and I start doing like marketing and interviews. And um, and so it's been kind of for almost a year now, it's been just sort of. <laughs> you know, 15 hour days every day. And that has been 
becoming very, very draining. Um, but I think there have been some positive things as well. I think in many ways, my kids, they're five years apart um, because they're kind of forced to be in the same room together all day, every day. Actually, they've learned to be really good friends and they've learned to play <laughs> together really nicely. So, you know, there's I think it's been a really tough challenge for a lot of people. But then, of course, there's there's every every cloud, right? It has its silver lining. So I try to right. focus on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Christina, because this story do no harm uh, had such a personal connection for you and a, and a family connection that you that you spoke about earlier uh, was there ever a time in writing where uh, you felt that um, that you were too close to the subject matter and and maybe what you were writing um, did, did you ever have to go back and say no I, I can't say that or I can't you know, that this wouldn't happen in this story, I'm, I'm too close to this. Uh, uh, you know, it, we, you want it to be an engaging read, uh, of course, but you also, you had a kind of a personal stake in the story. Did, was there ever a time where, where you were just too close to it? I don't think so. Um, I'm trying to think, I, I actually can't recall if that's ever happened to me because I, I feel that, I mean, I'm not trying to tell a real story. I'm just right. trying to an authentic emotional I'm just trying to get an, an authentic emotional connection so I think that by me putting you know bits of my life and you know this, this personal aspect into the book it connects me to to the story more than just words on paper and therefore I can write stronger and I can hopefully get that stronger connection with my reader so so far that hasn't happened to where I've I've needed to step away but equally, like with with the night Olivia fell, you know, by the time I sat down to write it, my dad my dad had passed away maybe the year I think, almost a year before. So you know, I'd had some time and space to process, and then I wrote it. Um, and and with this one, this is with do no harm. You know, my brother's addiction to opioids is an ongoing thing, and so it's not like it's in my face right this second. So I've been able to write it emotionally, hopefully authentically, but so far that hasn't happened. And if it did, um, I would just have to step away from it or perhaps I would reach out to my agent or my editor and just say, can you give me some perspective on this? Cause that's, that's what they're there for. I mean, that they, they are so good at that is giving you perspective or giving you a way, a, another way to look at something. Absolutely. Well, I, if, uh, if, if do no harm is uh, is the the thriller that you start twenty twenty one off with, um, it's going to be a really good year for books. You must get this book. It's out available everywhere today. Uh, we're going to put links to it in the show notes uh, where you can grab it in Kindle edition or audiobook or paperback. Uh, however you like to read, you can grab it. Um, uh, Christina, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? Um, so my website is christina-mcdonald.com and they can also find me on Twitter and Instagram and that's at Christina Mac, M-A-C, 79. Or they can even find me on Facebook. I have an author page and that's Christina McDonald Author. Excellent. We'll link that up uh, to make it easy for folks to find you. Christina, this has been so much fun chatting. Uh, we're going to send everyone to pick up Do No Harm. Uh, and uh, thank you so, so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you. This has just been such an honor. What a treat. Thank you so much, Hank. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started. The Bad Company Complete Series Omnibus, Books 1 through 7. Humanity's Greatest Export, Justice. Space is a dangerous place, even for the wary, especially for the unprepared. The aliens have no idea. Here comes the Bad Company. 
The Bad Company Book 1, Colonel Terry Henry Walton, takes his warriors into battle for a price in this first installment of The Bad Company. He believes in the moral high ground and is happy to get paid for his role in securing it. Set in the Cutharian Gambit universe, Terry, Char, and their people humans, werewolves, were-tigers, and vampires form the core of the Bad Company's direct action branch, a private conflict solution enterprise. Join them as they fight their way across Tissakinan 4, where none of the warring parties were what they expected. The seven-book series Omnibus includes The Bad Company, Blockade, Price of Freedom, Liberation, Destroyer, Discovery, Overwhelming Force. Grab the complete Bad Company series by Craig Martell now. How to Be a Badass Witch by Michael Anderley. Virtutus Gloria Mercies. Translation, glory is the reward of valor. Fed up with playing the normal game, recent university graduate, ex cum laude, ex soccer star, ex popular and mostly broke Cara Madonna changes her life when she decides to research how to be a witch and believes it. Cara didn't want to go back east and deal with her overbearing mom, so when university was done, she stayed behind in Los Angeles. Little did she realize how controlling moms can be from the other side of the country. Feeling a little desperate to make her own way, she buys a few books on business and one on a lark, How to Be a Badass Witch. That's when the trouble started. Find out just what trouble a young woman can get into when the magic just might be real. How to Be a Badass Witch by Michael Andrews.